And it's a great pleasure to welcome Paul here. He's over here at the ESS, the, the, SAC, the council, the ESS council meeting. So we thought we'd take, a, take the opportunity to get him to give a seminar him here. Um, Paul and I go back a long way, um, in fact, a very long way. And um, so it, it's, it's a great pleasure to sort of uh, to think back on the time that we've been working together in different ways. Um, uh, he came from Edinburgh. We did physics in Edinburgh, I think, and then you came to Kiel for your PhD, uh, where you joined the uh, what I think was a, still think was a remarkable biophysics group that we had had there, and that was uh, mm. we did some amazing things, thought about amazing things, and it was a great little group, uh, which I shall remember very fondly. Uh, not least the Wednesday evenings that we used to to overindulge in the pub in the evening, which was was were very memorable events and um, but. Uh, as I remember it, you then moved eventually from Kiel to ILL, where you worked on the D19 diffractometer, which I also later uh, started working on as well, which is an amazing experience and an amazing instrument, in fact. Um, and then after that, I think uh, you went to, to Los Alamos, uh, to the Lance source, and worked with Benno Schoenborn on developing, um, it was called the, the protein crystallography instrument there. And I'm trying to, I'm testing my memory now, but I think then, after, after quite a while there, you moved to Oakridge Lab as a senior scientist and subsequently became uh, associate director there. Um, and after quite a long time there, you then moved to ILL as the, as the, U, the director general of the UK and director at ILL, where you are now. So it's a great pleasure to, to, uh, to have you here to talk about what you've been doing at ILL and what, what the, the, next, uh, the next stage of biological development is going to be and the science that's coming out of it. So thank you for coming along and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Trevor, for those kind words of introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming along to this seminar. Um, and Trevor, thanks for inviting me to, you know, I, I really like the links concept. Um, I know that there's huge opportunity developing links and as we continue to grow our program of neutron and X-ray scattering in Europe. So it's exciting to be here. Um, as Trevor said, my name is Paul Langan, and I'm director of the Institut Louis Longevin, or the ILL, as we say. And at the, uh, the ILL is a leading center for neutron science and technology located in Grenoble. And um, right here, this is the reactor here. And um, we produce um, intense beams of neutrons so that visiting researchers can come and do neutron scattering studies of the materials that they're interested in. So researchers from across Europe and across the world visit us in order to gain a more fundamental understanding of their materials, the structural and dynamics of their materials. And, um, not only do they want to make new scientific discoveries, but they also want to improve their materials um, in order to enable new technologies. Um, the ILL is co-located with the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, a world-leading photon source. And between the ILL and the ESI, um, there's the Grenoble European Molecular Biology Lab, EMBL and also the, the Structural Biology Institute, the EBS. So on this campus, we call it the European Photon and Neutron Campus, there really is co-located in the same place within walking distance, and um, some of the most powerful experimental capabilities um, that users can um, have access to that use beams of electrons, photons, and neutrons. So it's a really exciting place to do science. And um, furthermore, around this scientific research anchor, and several um, tech companies have um, co-located in order to um, exploit and leverage our facilities. So there's a kind of ecosystem for innovation that's been developed in Grenoble over the past 10, 20 years. Um, and, and I think yeah, the reason why I talk about that is because I see similar really similar opportunities in Lund to develop the same type of um, innovation ecosystem. It, it, I think there are three ingredients um, to have a successful dynamic um, innovation ecosystem. One is world-leading experimental 
capabilities and you have them at Max4, you will have them at the ESS. The second is a brilliant top-class university. In Grenoble, we have the UGR, the University Grenoble Arts. In Lund, you have, um, and the surrounding region, you have really top-class universities. And the third key ingredient is a metropolis or a city or a local authority that invests in the infrastructure to facilitate interactions between university experimental facilities and new tech companies. And you have that as well. So exciting time in Lund. Um, um, every day, about 30,000 researchers come onto this um, innovation ecosystem site in the press field between the Drac River and the Eve there um, to develop new, um, to do research that enables new technologies. Um, so I, I just want to say a few very basic words about why neutrons are important mm -hmm. in the context of materials research. You know, material scientists use a variety of different techniques to better understand materials. And many of those techniques are based on the use of beams of electrons, X-rays, or neutrons. And each of these techniques sees materials in a different way. For example, for example, electrons interact through um, with materials through the coulomb potential of atoms. You know, so it's an electrostatic interaction. It's incredibly strong. And because of the strength, um, electrons have, have very limited penetration. They can see things incredibly easily. And they can also cause radiation damage. And photons interact with um, the atomic electron cloud of atoms through the electromagnetic interaction. They can be highly penetrating if they're small wavelength hard X-rays. And they're very powerful. Um, and for locating atoms and their dynamics, they're, they're scattered in proportion to the atomic number of an atom. So the more electrons an atom has, the easier it is to be seen by photons. The fewer electrons an atom has, the more difficult it is. So one of the limitations of using photons or X-rays <clears throat> is that light elements like hydrogen and lithium are almost invisible to, to photons. And neutrons are neutral. You have no residual charge. And so they're highly <laughs> penetrating. They interact directly with the nuclei of atoms through this strong nuclear force. And so they don't depend on atomic number. And you know, light atoms like hydrogen, lithium, sodium are easily seen with neutrons. Um, and we can also differentiate between I isotopes such as hydrogen and deuterium. Um, a disadvantage of neutrons is, although they interact through the strong force, their interaction is actually kind of weak compared to electromagnetic and electrostatic, electrostatic interactions. Um, another thing is the, you have spin or magnetic moments. So neutrons are like little magnets and they interact strongly with magnetism deep within materials, both, you know, and magnetism associated with the atomic electron cloud and nuclear magnetism. Um, and also, they have energies that are really well matched to um, atomic and molecular vibrations in materials. So they can be used inelastically to determine dynamics. And they have wavelengths that can be um, tuned from, from between a fraction of an angstrom all the way to nanometers. So they've got an incredibly wide range of wavelengths that allows neutrons to be um, tailored to looking at very small atomic resolution structures or huge big you know, um, complex molecular um, bio, biomolecular structures. So the important thing is that um, neutrons have a combination of unique properties which makes them useful. In, in combination with X-rays and photons. All of these techniques are incred incredibly important in a complementary way. And increasingly, researchers use combinations of neutrons, X-rays, and electrons to get a complete picture of their complex system with orthogonal information from the different techniques. Good. And there's, there's one other property for neutrons that is important and, and some applications in particular in particle physics. 
and that just has gratitude. And so researchers use the ILO to conduct high impact science in many areas, for example, and um, we use neutron scattering, imaging, radiation. We use neutrons in particle physics to make new scientific discoveries. This example here is um, some work we're doing, and we've been doing for some time to try and detect um, and other dimensions or extensions of our universe, um, which are um, required in some of the extensions of the standard model in particle physics. And we use the fact that neutrons have magnetic properties to explore new states of physics, like topological materials, quantum spin liquids, to better understand them so that we can develop new materials and technologies that could lead to the next generation of computers and, com and communications. Um, and we provide over 40 beamlines tuned to different types of measurements and different types of science. And we're actually coming to the end of a long decade of improving our instruments. And within the next year and a half, we'll have a suite of instruments with unprecedented capabilities for doing new science. And we actually start the start talk, the reactor after the long shutdown early <laughs> next year with some new instruments and instruments that have been improved to have new capabilities. So we're very excited about the new science that we're going to start doing next year with our upgraded instrument suite. So I'm actually not going to um, talk about the facility itself. And I'm not going to talk about individual applications of neutrons to particle physics or, or condensed matter physics. Rather, I want to emphasize the benefits of being co-located on the European Photon and Neutron Campus by giving you some science examples that have come from partnerships or use of neutrons, X-rays, and electrons. Okay, so I have a few examples. Um, that are just my favorite examples at the moment. They're recent examples, and I just really like them. So the first thing, the first partnership that we have in Grenoble is one that Trevor was involved in setting up, and it's a partnership between the EMBL, ESRF, ILL, and IDS, the Structural Biology Institute in the ILL, um, to develop common platforms and common access modes um, for structural biology. So this partnership actually enables and operates and makes available about 20 different experimental platforms and for visiting researchers. And um, those platforms include enable access to neutron and crystallography for looking at enzymes and, and drug targets and cryo-EM for um, looking at um, you know, single particle reconstruction of complex materials at the nanometer level. And um, also X-ray crystallography for really complex systems including this um, potassium membrane channel and also cryo and um, tomography or TEM and um, and triangle tomography for looking at huge structures like um, this um, uh, uh, chemoreceptor array and that was expressed in that um, E. coli um, almost at the scale of a micron, just under a micron. So an incredible um, set of um, different platforms that enable looking at biology all the way from the atomic scale almost to the micro scale. And I'm going to give you one example of in, in the area of biology and um, using neutron crystallography, which um, is led by a group from Oak Ridge National Lab and, and NIH and involves ILL and, and collaboration through the, the Partnership for Structural Biology. So as you all know, um, the coronavirus um, SARS-CoV-2 um, it's, it's quite a simple structure. It consists of a membrane and spike proteins that interact with um, ACE receptors in human host cells and densely packed nuclear protein, which is their genetic information, in addition to some um, envelope proteins and membrane proteins. There are also a set of associated helper proteins, in particular, a, prote um, a main protease. And in this project, it's led by 
um, Oakridge University. Um, the members of the team wanted to design drugs um, or inhibitors um, against the coronavirus. So one of the, you know, when the virus attacks a host cell, and the spike protein of the virus binds to the ACE receptor. And then the spike protein goes through a kind of conformational change. There's a subunit called S2 that unfolds a bit. And actually, and there's, and, and, and that it, it breaks at one point and it displays some fusion proteins in F1 to F4 in particular. They interact with the membrane and disrupt the membrane and allow the viral membrane to fuse the host membrane. And then the genetic information, the nuclear protein is released into the host cell. And once the genetic information is in the host cell and there's the host cells own um, replication and transcription ma machinery expresses a long polypeptide, a viral polypeptide. And then that viral polypeptide gets chopped off into functional units by the main protease. So the main protease from the virus is a really key enzyme in ensuring that the virus can go to develop to maturity and then can infect other cells. So this team wanted to develop inhibitors or drugs that bind to the main protease to stop it doing its job to prevent viral infection. We wanted to use neutrons rather than um, traditional X-rays because um, when an inhibitor binds to its target, it does so through hydrogen bonds and electrostatic interactions that are determined by the protonation state of residues in the binding site. So seeing hydrogen is really important for drug binding. When you use photons to determine the structure of a protein, what you see is essentially the, the, skeleton, the structural skeleton of the protein. But in order to see hydrogen, um, you need to look deeper with, with neutrons. So this team um, collected a large number of neutron structures of the main protease with different drugs bound using an instrument called LADI at the IOL. And we've actually just built a second <laughs> instrument, a second end station called DALI. So now we have two end stations that enable um, protein crystallography and for um, drug design. So they collected data from um, various, and um, they, they selected a bunch of different um, existing inhibitors um, against diseases that attack, um, against inhibitors that attack um, proteases for herpes and AIDS. You looked at the how these existing inhibitors bound to the protease. And um, the protease is it's actually a dimer. And um, these two um, images are just really the, the, the representation of the same thing, but one is a surface representation, the other one is a skeletal representation. Um, but from the information they got from the neutron studies of the, the different existing inhibitors bound, and to the, the binding site, they rationally designed new inhibitors, you know, taking different features from existing drugs and building up a number of new drugs that might be more effective and bind and more strongly. Um, and this is one of the um, inhibitors that they rationally designed. You can see that it has a beautiful um, pattern of very strong hydrogen bonds between the inhibitor here and the binding pocket informed by neutron studies. Um, and they actually found that um, one, most of their inhibitors did have antiviral activity you know, in, in vivo assays, but one of them inhibitors performed almost just as well as um, the, the, the Pfizer oral um, 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 inhibitor that was developed by a year after the, the COVID-19 pandemic started. So it's a really successful example of using neutrons to do in rational drug design. Having said that, I think the coolest thing from this study is the following. Um, so this is the binding site of the main protease with, di with different drugs, different structures overlaid. 
and you know, so and there are structures determined with different inhibitors, including the Pfizer drug. And when I look at this, is and it's it reminds me that what we find was that as different inhibitors come into the binding site, they actually push the binding site around is is malleable or plastic, and they squeeze in by distorting the surrounding um, protein. And so it's, it's not like a rigid binding site and uh, a rigid inhibitor that comes in to, you know, a lock and key sort of mechanism. The inhibitors actually push things about and squeeze in to form tight bonds. And the other thing which I think is even more important is when you look at the binding site, the electrostatic pattern in the binding site changes after the inhibitor binds. In other words, the inhibitors induce changes in protonation within the binding site to establish an electrost electrostatic pattern that fits it. And that kind of induced um, prot protonation, I think is something that's really new in drug design. I think it's a really cool discovery. And um, so great work. Um, so another partnership that we have on the campus is a partnership for soft condensed matter. Um, and they were also active during the pandemic and trying to understand how the virus um, gets access to host cells. And they did some they, they um, did some really nice work where they looked at the spike protein interacting with the cell membrane and seeing that the spike proteins actually pull out individual phospholipids in a way that weakens the cell membrane. Um, and a little bit later on, they also looked at how the spike protein fusion peptides actually gain access and disrupt the membrane so that the, um, the genetic material can be injected into the host cell. And I want to talk about that a little bit. So as I said, when the spike protein binds to the ACE receptor, um, there's a subunit S2, which kind of changes conformation and unfolds and makes it available for um, fusion peptides in particular. And they looked at using a technique called reflectometry, which involves reflecting in, in neutrons of a flat surface, a membrane surface. They looked at how the, the four different fusion peptides, FP1 to FP4, interact with the membrane. And what they found out was that um, one fusion peptide, in particular FP, I think it's FP4, uh, it's either FP4 or FP1, but one peptide in, partic in particular um, binds into the membrane and goes a little bit in um, when there's very little calcium present. When you increase calcium levels, the peptide goes all the way across the membrane. And when you reduce calcium levels again, it kind of cools back out again. Um, and there was another fusion peptide in particular, um, and it's either FP1 or FP4. There are two, and I can't remember which is which, but there's another one um, which binds across the phospholipid um, head groups. It doesn't insert, it just sits on the membrane really strongly. And from that information, they were able to develop a model which explains how the virus could actually insert its genetic material into the host, the host cell. And so this is a schematic picture that shows the S2 subunit of the spike protein. And then this oval, oval I think is um, FP4, and then this is FP1. I could have it mixed around with that. But anyway, this is the one which binds really strongly to the um, phospholipid chain groups. And this is the one that it inserts itself in. So outside our cells um, in our body, there are actually quite high calcium levels um, which promote um, FP1 inserting itself into the membrane. And here you see the other fusion pro um, protein flat on the membrane, sticking to the membrane and pulling the virus inwards. But as soon as um, the, our host cell membrane gets exposed, the cytoplasm inside our host cell is actually really low in calcium. So it causes the, uh, the FP4 
and factory to pull out and give access um, of the virus to um, to the host cell. That's a kind of cool um, result from using reflectometry um, to provide us with information about how um, the virus invades host cell. Facilitated by our partnership with structural condensed matter. Uh, right, something totally different. Um, but again, um, some work based on local partnerships. Um, the, we have a, a battery hub in Grenoble, which has partners including ESRF, ILL, CERUBA, and um, the, the Center for Atomic, the, the Commission for um, Center for Atomic Energy or Alternative Energy. Um, and um, the battery hub and our researchers look at a variety of different types of battery technologies and materials for different technologies, including lithium batteries, sodium batteries, different types of electrodes and electrolyte, electrolytes and membranes, etc. But one technology that's gaining a lot of interest um, is um, batteries that are based on solid sodium electrolytes, batteries within which everything's solid and it's based on sodium conduction. There are already sodium batteries um, that are operational. This one produced by CNRS and CERUBA um, is in fact not a solid electrolyte um, battery. I think it's a, a liquid electrolyte. Um, but I just want to make the point that sodium batteries are making progress and they are being used. And um, but this, this group from CNRS um, and a number of different collaborators were interested in exploring ion conduction in a particular and um, promising um, sodium electrolyte code and sodium biophosphate. Okay. And um, it has a, a known, it's, it's polymorphic. It can go through different crystal phases as a function of temperature or pressure. And in this X-ray experiment, they looked at the changes in crystal structure. And um, you know, this is Q, um, and these are bright reflection as a function of temperature. And what they saw was that there is an alpha phase that's stable up until about 250 centigrade. And then there's a slow second order transition to a beta phase. And then finally, right at the top, at about 500 Celsius, there is a very abrupt first order transition to a phase um, which um, is it's still crystalline, but has, it has very little long-range order. Um, this is the, the unit cell volume as a function of temperature. And you can see the slow second order transition between alpha and beta, and then the very abrupt first order transition to the gamma, the high temperature gamma phase. And the fact that that's Second order and that's first order has been confirmed, you know, with them um, in heat and thermal measurements. And so they determined the crystal structure in the alpha and the beta phase. And what they found out was that it's tetragonal at room temperature. And green are the sodium ions. There are like the two, there are two different positions. Um, represented by different shades of green, yellow, sulfur, and blue is phosphate. So you have these um, biophosphate tetrahedrons um, and then sodium ions in between. And when we go from the tetragonal alpha phase to the um, cubic beta phase, and um, the sodium ions change positions along the c-axis and the tetrahedra reorient a little bit so we go, so the, the symmetry becomes simpler. We get cubic phase. That seems pretty straightforward. But then they collected some um, total scattering. And total scattering is a bit like the fraction that you measure everything and you use all of the, the information to generate pure distribution functions and through a Fourier transform. And they did x ray and neutron total scattering. This is a pure distribution function from one of the X-ray measurements. And these peaks represent interatomic distances. And what they found was the interatomic distances of, of atoms um, in the tetrahedra did not change 
across the full transition from alpha, beta to gamma. And, and furthermore, going from alpha to um, beta, the and distances between and those tetrahedra and the sodium atoms didn't really change at all also. And so from this, they believe that the beta phase isn't really cubic. It has an average cubic structure. But, and what's really happening is that there's a dynamic disorder, a real you know, time dynamic disorder, and also a spatial statistical disorder of the tetrahedral units that produces on average a cubic structure. And actually when I saw this, it immediately reminded me of ICE-7. I don't know if you know about ICE, but there's one particular phase called ICE-7, which has a very simple structure. It's disordered, the water molecules in, inside are disordered. Um, but when, and the, the bond lengths don't make sense in this simple high resolution disorder structure. The bond lengths in I7 are all too small. But when you do look at pure distribution function, you see that the waters actually aren't um, distorted. They're real waters. It's just you see a statistically average structure that distorts things. So I think that, that was kind of cool. Um, and what we actually have is this structure surviving into the beta phase that was disordered. And furthermore, when you go into the high temperature structure above 500, all of the peaks um, associated with so sodium disappear. So you've effectively got a fluid or a liquid-like sodium structure. But the, te the, te the thiophosphate tetrahedrons are still there. And so there are um, tetrahedron spaced in a cubic structure with a fluid of, or a liquid of sodium in between. So I think it's really interesting. Um, and that's confirmed with um, inelastic neutron um, and, and, you know, density of states measurements, which show that you know above 500, there, there are no local vibrations in sodium, it's just a fluid. So this study showed that the beta phase, although it's cubic on average, has tetragonal local structure with dynamic and static disorder. Gamma phase is made of phasic. And there's a complete change. But the interesting thing is that at these sulfur and phosphor positions, there's huge opportunity to actually dope or change um, to um, other elements. And that's be already started to be explored. So, and um, this is the high, this is the phase, the beta phase has high conductivity. So the, um, the exciting thing is the potential to dope this, to change the, um, to change the temperature at which you get transition from alpha to beta. <laughs> I thought that was quite interesting. Neutrons were absolutely essential um, because neutrons provided not only the pure distribution information, but also the and density of states, vibrational information to interpret, to help interpret the data that was collected using metrics. Oh, right. So I'm not gonna say much about this. I just I wanted to show you this um, brief example because we, we have two imaging stations at the ILO and we're building a third one. It's actually another end station for this neutron imaging station called NEXT. And we can collect both X-ray and neutron data at the same time. And so we can do neutron and X-ray tomographic um, imaging um, with really good um, time resolution on complex engineer components. And um, this is the neutron detector. That's the X-ray detector. Spatial resolution here is pretty good for imaging. It can be down to five microns. And this, the time resolution can also be pretty good. It can, it can be down to a second. And um, so it's interesting. And in this simply, and we, we, we use it for a variety of different studies, including looking at, you know, fuel cells and, and batteries, that type of thing, through you know, lithium back, um, migration. But in this case, um, they looked at concrete drying. Um, or concrete um, under heat, um, which is important for a number of reasons. Um, the structural integrity of concrete, 
they're also, and I, I didn't know this until I spoke to the instrument scientists, but apparently when a building catches fire, um, you know, the concrete heats up. And if there's any water that's trapped within the concrete in a way that um, doesn't have a path outwards, it can, there can be a huge buildup of steam that catastroph catastrophically releases at some stage and concrete fails and then the building collapses. So understanding how, you know, the mechanism for concrete drying and what happens during heating is really important. But anyway, in this example, we collected extra tomographic data to look at the development of fissions or fissures in the concrete and we use neutrons to look at um, how the moisture traveled within the concrete as, as it was being dry. So neutrons can show, distinguish between the um, grains and different parts of the cement or different um, moisture contents or X-rays find that much more difficult. The X-rays are really good for looking at fissions or, or fissures, fissures in concrete. Um, oh, okay, good. So this is another kind of um, area where we have a huge amount of collaboration on campus, and, and you know, it, it's focused on um, ion exchange membranes or just membranes in general. There are many, many new technologies that are being developed today that involve using polymeric exchange or electrolyte membranes, including fuel cells and electrolyzers that generate hydrogen from water, you know, feed it, you know, pumping in photons to produce electrons that um, convert water into hydrogen. And the, this approach is quite well developed when it comes to fuel cells that um, transport hydrogen or protons across the membrane. So, you know, um, hydrogen comes in and it, it usually interacts with a catalyst like um, platinum, then um, protons are transported across a polymeric electrolyte membrane to a cathode and, um, and you know, water, is, water is the result. So here we have hydrogen fuel producing electricity with the waste product water. So it's a pretty clean way of generating electricity. The problem is that the catalysts used are um, quite difficult to combine, quite expensive. And looking at the alternative um, of, um, of um, creating hydroxyl ions and transporting them across is attractive because it doesn't require such extreme and noble metal catalysts. So this team um, from UC, um, led by UC London, have been looking at cells and um, anion electrolyte membranes um, that take in air and water um, and the, the catalysis produces um, um, hydroxide ions that flow across the membrane and interact with incoming hydrogen to, to, to produce water as a waste product. So again, it's pretty clean and um, it's, it's um, more favorable than um, proton um, transport membranes just because it uses um, catalysts that are and establish control resources. So very little is known about the mechanism of hydroxyl transport across the membrane. And it's been studied before using neutrons. And the thought is that um, transport is largely determined by bulk water. And you know, be vehicular, vehicular in the States I would say be vehicular transport, where the hydrogen just gets carried, carried along the bulk water. Um, and also popping, you know, when um, a hydroxyl ion pops from site to site, either through proton transport or dihydroxyl hydroxide ion popping from site to site. And then, of course, there's the dynamics of the, um, the polymer background itself. The membranes, in this case, are made from um, hydrophobic backbones with um, 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 ionic side chains. So these are the hydrophobic backbones got backbones with methyl groups, and this is the um, cationic side chain. Um, okay, good. So the, the, the team in this case used a range of different neutron spectrometers, three different neutron spectrometers that covered different 
trained skills, the trained skills that they thought would be involved in the dynamics of hydrocarline um, transport across the membrane. So all the way from a fraction of a picosecond to nanoseconds. And they did something that was really clever. Um, so they used a technique called backscattering, neutron backscattering, which involves measuring inelastic scattering from hydrogen. And um, so by measuring inelastic scattering from um, hydrogen, you can determine the, the dynamics of um, molecules that have hydrogen in them. And in this case, they, um, first of all, looked at a normal sample with water, hydroxyl ions, um, and, the and the polymer backbone inside group. And they were able to see um, the dynamics of everything, all of the hydrogen atoms in the system. So hydrogen are the methyl groups of the polymer, water, and hydroxyl. It's very complicated. Every everything's piled up on top of each other. And so they substituted the OH and H2O with deuterium. So they removed the water and hydroxyl group and saw only the di dynamics from the polymer um, backbone and side chain. So they could focus in on the polymer. Um, and then they removed the hydroxyl group and replaced it in, in, with brom bromine or bromide. And so they removed the hydroxyl group from the scattering data. So they were able to separate out each component of the, 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 um, the membrane. Um, in order to get the dynamics of, of each of these different components. Really cool. Um, and it's not been seen, that popping has not been seen experimentally using neutrons. So I'm not going to go into detail here, but the collected elastic data first, and we saw the elastic, the intensity of the data changing. And um, as they went from, so with backscattering experiments, you usually freeze your sample and then you bring it up in temperature. And as you increase the temperature, different motions start at different times. So they increased the temperature and then we saw the, the elastic scattering decreasing and because of and rotations of methyl groups on the, the polymer backbone. And then at a different regime, we saw a, a significant drop in intensity due to the side chains of the polymer starting to move about. And then another change as well, water started to move about. And then finally, we actually saw um, hydroxyl ion popping um, you know, um, at high temperatures for the first time. Um, and the, I'm not going to go through this, but I want to point out that it was a really nice experiment because at the top, they were able to focus in on the polymer dynamics by replacing water and hydroxyl ions by their deuterium fringe parts. And you saw the dynamics here. They were able to use a very high resolution instrument at the IOL called IN16 in order to confirm the presence of hydroxyl ion popping or proton movement. And then they, um, they, they changed the water content um, of their cell during the experiment to get the water dynamics of the bulk water. Um, really complex story, um, but the key message is they were able to confirm the reductions in conductivity of those cells. And um, the, 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 it's been thought in the past that hydroxyl ions de chemically degrade the membranes, but they were able to show that reductions in conductivity are really associated with a reduction in dynamics, not chemical degradation of the membranes. But they were able to show that at very low levels of hydration, popping dominates. And as you increase the water uptake, um, bulk water dynamics um, takes over and vehicular transport takes over. In other words, hydroxyl ions being carried along with groups of water hydrating them. Anyway, the real reason I wanted to show you this example is not because of the science, because it says it's disentangling, disentangling, because it's a segue to my next example. And this is my last example and my favorite one. And it's about untangling, the, not disentangling, untangling the threads of cellular commercialization. 
So, um, very quickly, um, cell neurosis is a material that's produced in plants and bacteria. And in plants, there's a membrane bound complex, um, a cellular synthase complex that um, takes glucose units and joins them up into linear cellular polymers. Um, and those polymers are um, extruded out into um, the cell wall of a plant or the calcule of a bacterium. Um, and all of, all of the polymers are pointing in the same direction, they're parallel, the hydrogen bond into sheets, and then these sheets pack together through hydrophobic forces, and they make um, nanofibers that have really high tensile strength. They're, they're nanofibers, high tensile nanofibers, with the cellular chains of polymers all pointing in the same direction. And we actually determined this structure using small angle neutron scattering and, and deuteration. By using small angle neutron scattering and deuteration, we, we were able to visualize different components of this complex. Um, and if it's a plant cell wall, these um, high tensile strength nanofibers, they bundle up together into macrofibers. So they're bundles of fibers. Um, and then these cellulose bundles um, also associate with other polymers like lignin and hemicellulose. They're like a kind of rebar in concrete. They provide structural strength to plant cell walls. And, um, you know, these bundles can consist of um, nanocrystals in which all, all the fibers are parallel, or the nanocrystals can be antiparallel. So within the nanocrystals, everything is parallel, but you know, nanocrystals themselves can be up or down. And we determined this structure using, again, um, small, angle, small angle neutron spectrum. We actually determined this plant structure to understand how plant biomass can be pretreated during biofuels production. And we also determined the crystal structure within each of the nanofibers. Again, using neutrons because neutrons can see hydrogen and these nanofibers or crystals are held together through hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen is a key. And this is a cellulose chain. You can see it's got a directionality. You know, this end is different from this end because here there's a ring oxygen, here there's a hydroxygen cell group. Here's a hydrogen atom forming an interchain hydrogen bond. Here's a hydrogen atom forming an interchain hydrogen bond. But the key thing is that all the chains are pointing in the same direction. Um, and, which, and this is cellulose um, from plant matter. Once it's been dipped into sodium, um, weak solutions of sodium hydroxide. It goes through a complete morphological change and comes out you know, as a beautiful textile. And this process was actually identified back in the 1800s by an English chemist called Mercer, John Mercer. And the process is called mercerization. And it's used, still used today widely in the textile industry to take naturally occurring cellulose and transform it into a shiny, hard, um, dye receptive um, enhanced material, mercerized cellulose. So rayon, um, um, viscose, fortran, these are all mercerized cellulose. But, um, we also looked at the crystal structure of cellulose and mercerized cellulose. Um, and for some time it's been known that um, rather than the chains all having the same parallel direction. Um, every second chain has actually changed direction. And so the crystal structure is anti-parallel. Um, and that always per perplexed me. How can you have a nano rod that's thousands of mo monomers long and um, treat it with a little bit of sodium hydroxide and then get a crystal structure where the chains are now anti-parallel? I just find that really interesting. How can that happen? 
Um, and actually, two people have come up with different proposed mechanisms. So if you've got two nanocrystals sitting next to each other, and one's pointing down, one's pointing up, perhaps when you treat with sodium hydroxide, the, the two neighboring nanocrystals can swap chains or you know merge together so that you get parallel and anti-parallel chains. That mechanism was proposed by um, John Blackwell um, and, his, and his colleague Colpac back in the 1970s and 80s. And another possibility is that rather than the chains from different nanocrystals mixing, and perhaps within each nanocrystal, the chains can fold back on each other. So you kind of get a zigzag pattern of chains. And um, that mechanism was proposed by someone from Grenoble and who I collaborate with called Henri Chancery. So these are two possible explanations for what happens here. And um, we actually thought of an experiment to test which one is correct. Um, but just, for, just, for, just so that we know which is correct, there's no reason why we did this experiment other than curiosity. So we worked out that if we could generate a sample within which um, we have um, nanocrystals within which the cellulose is all deuterated, replaced hydrogen by deuterium, and um, a mixture of hydrogenated and deuterated cellulose, the scattering from the blue deuterated crystals will be very different from the scattering from the hydrogenated crystals. And the calculated scattering from that unit cell and those two unit cells will be very different. So if we can only get a sample where half of the nanofibers are fully deuterated and half of them are hydrogenous, and we can mercenize that sample and then we should be able to tell which, which proposed mechanism is, is correct. So we spent years, literally years, um, growing cellulose from a, a, a certain type of bacterium that produces a pellicle of cellulose, um, adapting that bacterium to grow in deuterated media so that the pellicle is completely deuterated. So we have nanocrystals and a pellicle that's been grown on completely, completely deuterated media. So the nanocrystals are deuterated. And then it took us years to find a way to free up those nanocrystals and then orient them into fibers for fiber diffraction. So we made pellicles of deuterated and hydrogenous cellulose. We oriented them um, and we, we took so we had samples like this, had you know, 50 percent deuterated, 50 percent hydrogenous, then we mercialized it and we collected neutron data. Um, and um, so this is fiber diffraction data collected using X-rays from cell from mercialized cellulose. Diffraction data collected from a sample with all deuterated cellulose, a sample with all hydrogenated cellulose and a sample where we had equal mixtures of nanocrystals which were deuterated and hydrogenous. And we measured the intensities and it was clear that this is the mechanism which, which actually happens within cellulose and as you mercerize it. That's really cool to answer the question. And that's a, that's a huge simplification. You know, it's probable that the cellulose fold back on each other, you know, on itself many times. And um, I have no idea what the use of this insight is, <laughs> but I just really wanted to know. But I do, I do notice that it's been seen in polymers, and in some polymers, under certain conditions, you can have regions in which the chains fold back on each other. It's called a shish kebab arrangement. Um, um, and interestingly, the mechanical properties of polymers that have this shish kebab arrangement are really interesting because if you stretch them, you can actually get lined polymers, and if you don't stretch them, um, their mechanical properties are completely different. So maybe there could be some 
and future um, use of um, this experiment. But for, for me, it was just the, the scientific interest of solving this problem. Good. Uh, so I just want to say that, you know, we're starting the use of program next year. We're incredibly excited about having a new suite of, instru of upgraded instruments with um, new experimental capabilities. We're going to upgrade for 160 days a year, three reactor cycles. Everyone can apply for game time. And we're really excited about the progress we've made over the past year in a big shutdown during which we, we, um, we improved the safety, security, and sustainability of our reactor. It's like a new reactor now. Um, and we've been strongly working away with the community to prepare for the restart. This is, these are some staff from Trevor's old group um, and life sciences who have been working with the user community to duplicate things um, and we're ready for the user program to start. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. It's been amazing to see all of those things and also very exciting to see that it's all coming back. One thing I forgot to mention, Trevor, yep. you were involved in that last example. Oh, that's just telling us. Why was the yes. useless result? So yeah, that, that, really yes, really I know. I mean, it was, uh, some of the data is ages old, right? It took a yeah. long time to put it all took, It took about yeah. four years to do the yeah. experiment. No, but it was, it's amazing that it's come out like that. It's published so beautifully in NatureCon, so it's, that's a great result. Um, but anyway, thank you very much. Beautiful results, lots and lots of optimism there, and uh, lots of optimism for the future. I, one of the things I wanted to ask you, I mean, are, are there any questions from anybody else before I ask my, my, my question? Any? Okay, well, anyway, we well, well, I've got one, Trevor. Right, who's that? It's uh, uh, Simon uh, Kimber. Um, <laughs> I just want to briefly comment on the, these claims of local symmetry breaking by the PDF techniques, <laughs> that example you showed. Um, I have to say that I basically disagree with this interpretation because, as in this case, most of these observations are made around second order phase transitions. In the example you showed, you had a tetragonal to cubic phase transition, which was continuous. Um, what we know from the, the Edinburgh School of, of Soft Mode Physics is that you've got a dynamic instability with associated atomic displacements, which will look like the low temperature distorted phase. Uh, and with the PDF method, you're, of course, measuring the instantaneous atomic correlations, not the time average ones that you see with diffraction. And that's why it looks like you have this local symmetry breaking. Um, and just to say that one of the last things I did in Oak Ridge before, well, before we both left, was you can actually use inelastic neutron scattering to do inelastically resolved pair distribution functions that show that all these effects go away. Uh, and it is just soft mode physics from the 1960s. Thanks, Simon. And it's good to hear from you. Um, I, I, I don't want to. Um, well, I should say that I'm representing someone else's work, and I hope I haven't misrepresented um, what they did in the paper. That's, that, that's the first thing. It could be that I'm misinterpreting what I read in the paper, but um, I completely agree that um, 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 I, th I think there are two things, aren't there? There's um, dynamic disorder and static disorder, and static disorder can be variations um, you know, throughout this, you know, throughout the sample, and um, I, but, um, and, and and I can't comment on which which is prevalent in this case. Um, but I, in the in the case of ice, you know, ice seven. Are you familiar with ice seven? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. What's your interpretation of that? Um, um, well, I think you, you've always there's there's. Without even worrying about real space stuff, there was always riding corrections that had to be made for, you know, protons bonded with um, very asymmetric motions, right? I don't, I don't know whether the bond length in I7 recovers to a reasonable value if you use the, the old Busing and Levy riding corrections. I don't know either, but I, I do know that the bond length is, that's um, extracted from the PDF is correct. It's, it's what, sorry, it's what you would expect, but as the bond length you extract from <laughs> The crystallographic structure, you know, based on the average structure, is way too short. Yeah. And and my understanding is that um, in this in that particular example, the bond lengths that one sees in the PDF are what you'd expect. 
um, and you can refine it using, you should, read the, you should read the paper actually, it's a really nice paper and it may be that I've misinterpreted it, but they did do a rate field refinement using, I can't remember what it's called, it's when you use a box or a rectangle to do a limited rate field refinement. They, they've got a tetragonal structure across the whole of that alpha, beta, eh, yeah, a tetragonal structure across the whole of that alpha, beta, you know, second order phase, phase you know, transition. But you know more about this than me. So I, I you know, I defer to your opinion. <laughs> Just... <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions from anybody online or offline? Let's go. Yeah, I have a more uh, sort of general question about the innovation environment. So, uh, so what about the computational facilities and expertise? Because uh, we need more and more computation to uh, make sense of all these, uh, these nice experiments. So, uh, so what about that sort of uh, infrastructure in Grenoble? How does that fit in? I think that's less well developed, actually. I, th I think that's fair to say. And um, we, I think we excel in working across experimental capabilities, um, and, but there's still opportunity to enhance um, our ability to bring high performance computing to bear. I mean, one of the questions, I, is there anybody else who wants to ask anything before I ask my question? One question I want to ask is, is this, although I suppose it's an obvious one, really, everything with the neutron business, everything is in a rather sort of critical stage with, uh, you know, the, the, the various sources, the obviously there's, there's, there's ILL, there's, there's ISIS, there's Munich, there's ESS, and it's at a sort of an awkward stage in terms of, you know, facilities coming online, facilities being developed. So it's, so it's an important but, but difficult stage. And one of the things I'd like to know is what, where do you see of the areas you've talked about um, the biggest opportunities lie and how would we go about maximizing the collaboration between a place like the ILL and the ESS? And, and how, how should we go about trying to cultivate that development? And I think that's something that really we at uh, Lynx is something we, we were interested in and we'd like to see how we could help with that type of process yeah. because it seems to me to be uh, an area where we shouldn't be missing that exploitation, even though there's a natural sense of you know, sources trying to be the best and so on. Maybe, how, how can we actually facilitate working together and bridging um, these divides? So, so, there were, so, so there were many parts to that question. Um, um, so, so let me talk from the point of view of the ILO first. Mm, sure. um, we, we see ourselves at the moment as providing a large fraction of the capacity for neutron scattering in Europe. Um, and we do think that we have um, a world class suite of instruments, and um, quite a few of them are world leading, and some of them are, some of them are unique. And we see the opportunity for us over the next few years to continue to be um, involved in producing a large fraction of the science that comes from the application of neutrons. Um, and in particular, we see a window of opportunity over perhaps even the next decade where that's not going to change. You know, if you want to do neutron scattering um, and photons and electrons, Grenoble is a really attractive place to come and do science. And, and with our new instrument suite, I think there are new experimental and scientific possibilities. And I, I kind of like the areas that I went through of applying neutrons um, to study the structure and dynamics of new materials that are associated with uh, big problems that we have at the moment. And, you know, I just chose um, a few recent ones that looked interesting, but we were applying neutrons across the whole range of different material science that, you know, has um, um, potential high impact. So I think the next few years um, is great for us, fully exploiting neutrons at the ILL to do the best science possible. I also see um, the community that we are building just now are continuing to build with ISIS and FRM2 and PSI has been a community who will hugely benefit from the, the new capabilities that will be delivered by the ESS. Um, and it's good that the community sees that on the horizon. We need the ESS, we need the new capabilities that it will provide. Um, and to continue to do new science. So the ESS is essential for us. And to, to turn it around, I think, and we're essential for the ESS, you know, 
IOL access is different to PSA. And if we're not if we're not there, the ES is in yes. a difficult situation yes. because it's you know in yeah. neutral music music community. And we've been um, talking to the ESS about um, ways that we can work together to make sure that over that second order transition, if you like, um, if everyone's successful. Um, but I think, um, and I'm, I'm speaking just from my own point of view. Now, I'm not speaking on behalf of IOL or any, or, you know, any country. Um, but I do see the IOL as having because it's reactive based yeah. as having strengths in certain areas that will remain and um, um, huge strengths after the ESS is built. Mm -hmm. I think there are some experiments that will be better done at the IOL and some that are better done at ESS because of the different nature of exploration mm -hmm. and continuous use. Mm -hmm. So they're highly complementary. Mm -hmm. And I think an opportunity for links is to make sure that users and so you know ILO and ESS are you know are, are both world class or world leading mm -hmm. and and you know ISIS has a yeah. you know yeah, sure. so I think the opportunity for links yeah. is to convene mm -hmm. and bring people together yeah. and network yeah. across that infrastructure facility to make sure that users have and mm -hmm. had an easy access to do the best thing as possible. And I think your opportunity is to um, so, you know, select a few areas that you're interested in or you think are incredibly important moving forward <laughs> and, and within which to convene the community, you know, to nucleate the community and to make sure that they're fully exploiting what's out there for them. Yeah. So I think for links, I think um, it's an incredibly exciting opportunity for women to, um, to become a, a kind of centre for you know, enabling people to do the best things yeah. possible. Yeah, and so I'm assuming that the ESS, for the ESS, the, the big priority really is in the time that it's taking to build it, then that the music community is cultivated and, and, and so that when it actually does open and the first beams start to be used, that, that people are there and ready. And that may be, or the, the areas of interest there might be to do with how you produce your samples or you know, just getting the whole laboratory environment and, and the programs available yeah. so that they're ready to go rather than sort of wait for the thing to get built up and then suddenly realize you've got to do something which is a little yeah. bit wasted so, opportunity. If, if, if I may add one more yeah. thing. Um, I, you know, we have, um, you, you will find that um, Lind um, develops um, platforms based on um, characterizing or preparing samples for Max Borer and ESS. And, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know I, some of the many of the examples I presented today were and um, trying to highlight what's possible by using local um, platforms. And um, but I think the the um, advantage in the future is for those partnerships not only to be looked at as platforms but also as centers for scientific you know excellence uh, with, with local groups of scientists from the facilities working through the partnership to do science that could be done anywhere else. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, I can also do that. Uh, any other questions? No? Anybody online? Any last questions? One thing that maybe we won't talk about it now, but uh, that's, uh, it always fascinates me is the potential, that's, uh, whether it's crystallographically or otherwise, the potential that neutrons have got to look at proteins, redox proteins, for example, yeah. It's just amazing, and I don't, I don't, we've done a little bit on it, but I don't think it's ever been fully capitalized on it, it, because it, it, it's just a crystal growth issue. And I think, um, because if you think about it, you know, you're clipping, clipping between ox, ox, oxidized and reduced state, and you've got all the sort of proton stuff going on relating to charge transfer and so on, and you can see that there are things going on there well below the surface of what you can see with x rays. And I always feel there's a bit of a thing that we're missing there in terms of uh, investing in or somehow prioritizing the, uh, the ability to facilitate crystallization. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the deuteration's there, a lot of people put effort into the deuteration, it's very important, um, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an effort there need for, needed for crystal genesis and the large crystal growth, which once it's tackled, 
um, you know, substantively, you're into a new epoch of, of stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. But that's a sort of, that's a lunch, lunchtime conversation. Okay. Any last questions? All right. Well, in that case, thank you very much, Paul, for a wonderful talk, and uh, um, and thank you, audience, from online and elsewhere uh, for coming along. So thanks a lot. Thank you.